That's why pretty much all the other fears are scary. Heights wouldn't be scary if, like, see, I have fear of heights. Um, heights wouldn't be scary if it wasn't scary to fall. Like, if you just fell and went bounce, 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 it'd be pretty fun. Honestly, it really would, if you think about it. I used to love rolling down hills as a kid and um, such things, but um, heights are scary because if you fall, you die. And so um, Jesus delivered us from fear of death. We now face a, uh, a, a wonderful resurrection. We, we have many good things to come. Well, where we are today is we are finishing up in the... Uh, about the doctrine of Christ, what the Bible has to say about him, and we're going to look at the uh, accounts of the prophecies of him. We're, going, we're finishing up what they call systematic theology, and we're moving to what they call biblical theology, that is, the doctrine unveiled through the Bible in uh, the scope of history, if you will, of the Bible. And uh, first today, we're going to look at the current ministry of Jesus. In other words, what's he doing today? Uh, turn with me, please, to 1 John chapter 2. What does Jesus do today? This is on the back page of the notes. And uh, the front page of the notes um, in the back is here. The back page is this side. Lee has it ingeniously set up to where you can just flip it straight over like a coin. Um, I'm messing with poor Lee because he was... Usually when you print something, you want it to go like this. Uh, I kind of prefer it to flip like this. It seems more natural to me, but um, anyway, that's usually what happens when I duplex print too. It usually turns out weird. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> what does Jesus do for us today? Uh, 1 John chapter 2. <laughs> My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We look at these verses here, and we see that we, as God's children, we're not supposed to sin. Of course we do, though, unfortunately. We live in sinful flesh, and uh, the attitudes and habits we've trained ourselves to sin in, we continue to struggle with. And when we do sin, instead of getting the death we deserve, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says, Jesus is our advocate with the Father. Uh, what is an advocate? It's not a word we use a whole lot in modern English. Uh, it's a lawyer, basically. Uh, it's sometimes, I think I've seen it, um, sometimes on you know the uh, lawyer signs, sometimes they say that. Uh, avogado is the Spanish word. And uh, that's pretty much the same almost. And uh, living down here in South Florida, it's good to know both English and Spanish words for common things. It's easy to learn it too. You look at nearly any sign. Uh, anyway, but uh, an advocate, he's, if you will, he's a lawyer before the Father. And uh, the point of this is he represents us before God instead of us representing ourself. And of ourself, um, what can we stand before the glory of God with? Uh, this glory of God is so great and powerful a thing that Moses said when he received the Ten Commandments, I quake in uh, fear exceedingly. And Moses was a prophet very different from any other prophet. Moses was such a close man to God. He was called the friend of God. When he would speak to God, he'd come back to the people of Israel, his face glowing with the glory of God. But Moses himself said he quaked in fear exceedingly. And um, not to disparage any of us, but I doubt we were quite the man Moses was. Um, Charlie probably is, but short of Charlie, the rest of us aren't. You know, um, he was a very special person. And uh, um, God can use each of us. I'm not trying to disparage any of us, but uh, and God does have plans for us. But Moses was a very special prophet, and he quaked and feared exceedingly. How can we stand before God? Well... We have a uh, advocate who stands in our place. It's interesting. Um, one time I got a ticket in St. Lucie County for speeding. And I lived here in Fort Lauderdale, of course. I really, really didn't want to drive up to St. Lucie County to pay my speeding ticket. So I hired myself an advocate, a lawyer, who stood on my behalf and uh, <clears throat> on my behalf represented me before the judge. So I think all I had to do was pay court costs. So I didn't get any uh, 
speeding ticket per se, but I still had to pay the court costs. It's interesting how the system works, but um, that's the way it does. The advocate stood on my behalf and he represented me. I didn't have to represent myself. I didn't want to go represent myself. And if I stood before the judge to represent myself, it probably would not have gone well. He'd have had to say, are you guilty? And I'd have pretty much had to say, well, yes. And because I was speeding, I was going to speed of traffic and I didn't notice that everybody else slowed down. So anyway, um, I got a speeding ticket. The lawyer stood in my behalf and on my behalf, he managed to get it. So I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to pay for the crime I committed if you will, just court costs. Anyhow, so that's the uh, concept of a lawyer. You know, they stand on your behalf. They represent you. They speak for you. And uh, Christ stands on our behalf. His righteousness speaks for us. Um, if we sin, we are not judged for our sin because Christ was already judged in our place. We have his righteousness, and before God, we're perfect, without spot, without sin. Um, and so that's his ministry in this current time. He stands in our place. He is a propitiation. That's an acceptable sacrifice. That's all that word means. Thank you. He's a propitiation for our sins. He already paid for them. They're already paid for. They're paid for in full. And uh, so we have nothing to fear. And uh, we see also, uh, this is kind of on a legal aspect of his current ministry, the moral aspect, if you will. Find in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hebrews 7.25 says this, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now see, when I got off legally from the ticket, I didn't get off morally from the ticket because I still had sped, if you will. And you really shouldn't speed. It's not really safe to do. And um, also the law says you shouldn't do it. So I was still morally guilty before the law for having sped, not legally. However, Christ not only pays for our sins on a legal basis, but also on a moral basis. It says, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost. I like this, how it says it. No matter how far from God you might stray or have strayed or will stray in the future, you are completely saved the moment you trust in Christ to save you. You're saved to the uttermost. Every sin paid for. And, uh, you're made righteous before God, made clean in His sight, because Jesus was that sacrifice on your behalf, and He is now that high priest who stands before God on your behalf. Back in the days of the temple uh, under Israel, the high priest once a year would come on the Day of Atonement, and he would offer for the sins of the people a special sacrifice. Now, every morning and evening, the priests also would offer a sacrifice, and uh, they would offer sacrifices for sins, for different sins. There were uh, sin offerings, trespass offerings. There were different burnt offerings. There was uh, different, for different sins, different sacrifices were required and things. But um, uh, Jesus was our high priest who once for all atones for us at the mercy seat of God in heaven. We no longer need a continual sacrifice. That one sacrifice is forever done, forever over. And... Uh, we rejoice in that because that means um, we no longer have conscience for them, if you will. It talks about here further in the book of Hebrews. They're paid for. They're done. They're settled. At the mercy seat of God, they're forever paid for. Uh, so this is Jesus' current ministry, what he's currently doing for us. It's something we ought to be very grateful for when you consider it, that God himself would have not only saved us from our sins, but continues to minister on our behalf. Uh, we seek Jesus' future reign. It is foretold of in the prophets. Now, we will look uh, a little bit later in today and uh, in the next week to come about what the prophets had to say about Jesus coming. They had to say a whole lot about it. But uh, we will look just briefly. Psalm 110. Psalm 110 says this... Uh, psalm 110, it says a psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. 
The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. This is a uh, very loaded prophecy. There's a whole lot. This is a pretty short little prophecy, but there's a whole, whole lot foretold in it. And basically, to greatly summarize things, the New Testament kind of fleshes this out for a little for us in the book of Revelation. Um, one day, this son of David, whom David calls Lord, and whom the Lord calls Lord, this son of David will one day be reigning again on the throne in Jerusalem. And he will come to his people. They will be willing in the day of his power. His people will turn back unto him. And it talks about he'll judge among the heathen. He'll fill the places with the dead bodies. The armies of the enemies surrounding Jerusalem will be defeated at that time. Uh, turn to Zechariah. It's one of what they call the minor prophets. You'll find Zechariah. If you have uh, trouble finding them, just uh, use your table of contents. But Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. Zechariah 12. And uh, this prophet foretells, among other things, the uh, end days for his people Israel. He says this, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that will come that come against Jerusalem. So this foretells of the end time the armies of the Antichrist will gather themselves against Jerusalem once and for all to try to destroy all the Jews. It's interesting, the devil has throughout ages tried to raise up people to uh, try to kill the Jews off. And um, he has forever stirred up in the hearts of people to be against God's people. Uh, you can trace it throughout the ages. The Romans did a lot against the Jews. Um, the Roman Catholic Church did a lot to persecute Jews. They said they represented Christ. They did not. They really just represented Rome. It was just really the continuation of Rome as a religious empire instead of a political empire because the political empire collapsed. The Roman Catholic Church extensively persecuted Jews. Uh, you can read about the Spanish Inquisition, and um, from what I gather, a part of, good part of the persecution was they just wanted the money which the Jews had. The, uh, many of the Jews in Spain were very clever bankers and things. They managed to, uh, they started the banking system, it seems, which is smart. It made a whole lot more sense to have your money in a bank than to have your money like where it can be robbed and stolen and those sort of things. It's just smart. So the Inquisition was about trying to steal money from them as much as anything else. Uh, one of the major enemies of the Jews everyone knows about, Adolf Hitler, managed to engineer the almost unthinkable murder of over six million Jews and like about three million Romanians and a lot of other people. Joseph Stalin killed, they don't really know how many Jews because Russia has, it's always, the deeds which happen in Russia stay in Russia, <laughs> they really do. Uh, it, I like studying Russian history and about Russia. It's um, it's hard to figure out most of what goes on over there because they just don't really talk. And uh, the East and West have never gotten along well, and so we don't really know what goes on there. And especially not during uh, the age of Stalin, but apparently a lot of persecution of the Jews under Stalin. Um, even in this time, there's uh, nations which have risen up and they vowed to destroy Israel, Iran and the other... Uh, uh, Palestine, all these nations around, they want to destroy the Jews. Ultimately, in the end, the Antichrist is going to be the ultimate manifestation of that, Satan's rod against God's people, and uh, Jesus is going to appear and destroy him. Him and all these people he will have raised up against him. Jesus is going to speak a word, and as it says, the sword from his mouth is going to destroy all these people 
uh, who have risen up against uh, God and his people. And this is what it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. Um, the, uh, God's people Israel will come back to him at that day. The book of Ezekiel talks about how the glory of God departed from the temple as uh, God was in preparation to send his people in captivity in Babylon. The glory of God departed from the temple, but God's glory is going to one day reappear in that temple and it's going to happen after this point when God comes back to his people. His people receive him. All iniquity is purged out of the land. And uh, it says in verse uh, 1, chapter 13, In that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the name of idols out of the land, and they shall be no more remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. So all the um, all the false prophets will be forever eliminated and uh, God's people will believe in him. They will receive him. They will receive Christ. He came unto his own, the Bible says, and his own received him not. When Jesus came, his people didn't receive him. The world didn't receive him even though it was the world he made. Um, when both uh, Jew and Gentile, if you will, did not receive the one who made them, but... Uh, when he first came, he was crucified on a Roman cross, condemned by a Jewish Senate, uh, sentenced by a Roman governor, and uh, executed by Roman soldiers. So all the world was guilty before God. Um, not just Jew, not just Gentile, but all the world guilty, that all the world could be saved. Because we're all guilty before God. Uh, as it says in the book of Romans, there's no difference um, that uh, the same Lord is rich unto all that call upon him, so all can be saved. But uh, <clears throat> we see this future reign of Christ detailed greatly in the New Testament. We do not have time to look up all the passages you have listed there. And this is not all the passages there are either. Um, this is just a summary of them, some of the more prominent and important ones. Um, turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Jesus is standing before the high priest here. This is the high priest Caiaphas. He was kind of an imposter, in a sense. Um, if I recall correctly, he had paid for his position as high priest. He, so he was, he was kind of an imposter. That was kind of the thing going on. If you paid the governor enough money you could, and paid other people, you kind of could buy the position of high priest to some degree. Um, there was a lot of strife in Israel at this time. And anyway, uh, so... He's standing before Caiaphas, and uh, Caiaphas says this to him in uh, chapter 26, verse 63. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's, telling, he's foretelling that one day he's going to return in power. There he was standing before uh, a earthly judge to receive a sentence of that earthly judge and to have his sentence executed at the hands of the uh, governor of the nation, Pontius Pilate. But one day he would come in power. He came subject to his people he'd made, but one day he will come in power. And uh, we look forward to that day whensoever it will be. <clears throat> um... Let's see. Um, there are a bunch of other ones here. Turn with me to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 5 says this, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and of the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also that have pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. 
I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which was and is and is to come, the Almighty. Jesus Christ is this uh, great King who will come one day and who will reign over the earth and uh, who will judge all sin. All, uh, all the iniquity of all ages will at the end time be paid for. We'll look at that in future lessons to come. There's a lot which is said about it. But <clears throat> um, one day all the evil will be forever dealt with. And uh, this prophesied up here. Um, turn to the very last, very last part of the book of Revelation. Very last part, it says this. Uh, chapter 22, verse 12, it says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. So he says he's coming again, and uh, one day he's coming to reign. We don't know when this is. Jesus said it. We know neither the day nor the hour when he cometh. He said he's coming as a thief in the night without warning. It could be at any time. We don't know when. And thus we're commanded to be ready. Um, those who've never trusted Christ as Savior yet, who've never uh, received his death to pay for their sins, when he comes, uh, the earth will be facing a seven-year period of judgment. And um, that's a period which is best missed. It's detailed in the book of Revelation. It's called the Tribulation. All kind of things happen in it. And uh, those who have received him will be taken up into heaven uh, without death, uh, taken straight up. And so we look forward to that blessed hope. <clears throat> Changing gears slightly, about the names of Jesus, there's several names he's called by in the scriptures here. Um, the first name is the name Jesus, of course. And this is kind of an anglicization of the Greekanization of the Hebrew which uh, basically means Jehovah saves. And it speaks of Jesus' purpose in coming to the earth to save us from our sins, to save his people from their sins, to save all the world from their sins. And uh, we see the word Christ. That's uh, basically the Greek version of the uh, Hebrew word Messiah. They both mean the anointed one. And it refers to him as the rightful king and deliverer of his people. Um, indicates he's the chosen one of God. He's one sealed to God's purpose. Remember King David, when he was anointed, he uh, received basically the position of being king. But he actually did not receive his rule until uh, almost 15 years later. Uh, he was anointed king, but then he ended up having to spend... A lot of the next 10, 15 years of his life fleeing from Saul who wanted to destroy him. And um, he became the deliverer of his people. When David took the throne, Israel was a somewhat divided nation. The northern half wanted to follow Saul. The southern half wanted to follow David. Um, it was a nation in great peril by the Philistines. Other countries around it were all threatening it. When David took the throne... He, uh, in very short order, was able to summarily defeat the enemies of Israel and deliver his people. So David pictured Christ who would come, and it was prophesied that David would, or that from the house of David would come the ultimate deliverer, and uh, that is Jesus. Why he's also referred to as the Son of David, um, the Son of God and the Son of Man. When Jesus would talk about himself, he would often refer to himself in the third person. And he would refer to himself as the Son of Man. However, he was not only the Son of Man, he was also the Son of God. And uh, this speaks of Jesus' deity and his humanity. He was both God and man. It talks about how his royalty and his servanthood. And uh, his ability to save us from our sins because he is God, but his ability to die on our behalf because he is human just like us. And... Um, it's interesting how God identifies himself with us by calling himself the Son of Man. He doesn't put himself above us, if you will, um, although he is far above us and far more glorious than we are. He's the exalted king of the universe, but he comes down to our level and calls himself the Son of Man, that we would know him, that we could be the friends of God, as it says. He said uh, in another place, um, Jesus' mother and his brethren were coming to see him, and he was with a group of his disciples. And uh, basically, 
what Jesus said about it is, um, uh, my f mother and my brethren are those who do my will. And uh, basically what he's saying is there's no one who's more, more special or less special in the kingdom of God, if you will. We are all very special to God. We are all, um, if you will, his family. Um, the uh, name Emmanuel... Um, Emmanuel basically means God with us. And uh, we find that in Matthew <coughs> chapter 1, verse 23. Um, for this one, I gave you a reference here. The others I didn't because the terms are used so frequently. But uh, for this one in particular, I gave you a reference because it really only occurs once. And uh, you find it as a prophecy. It fulfills Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, but you only find it one other time here. Um Matthew 1, 23. And behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. And this speaks of God being directly manifested in the flesh. This is God's presence directly with us and directly accessible to us. Um, the Word of God. Uh, we find this in several places. John chapter 1 talks about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. The last verse there says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we find in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 13, it talks about how when Jesus comes back again to reign, it's describing Him as He comes in His glory, and on His, uh, on his garment is written His name, the Word of God. I'm assuming it's probably written in Hebrew. That's just my guess. Just an aside, random trivia if you wanted, but I'm assuming it's written in Hebrew. Um, just extra aside. But anyway, um, uh, it's on his garments written that title, the Word of God. And uh, basically, Jesus is the complete revelation of God to man. He is the sum of what the whole Bible is about. It's about Jesus coming to save us from our sins. Uh, the book of Revelation describes how the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's what the prophets prophesied ultimately about, and that's what the end of it was, is that Jesus would come to pay for our sins. And uh, even if they spoke only indirectly of it, Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies. And he's the hope of redemption to all them who believe. He is uh, God manifested unto us. And uh, we find... Uh, we see him also called Savior. And it says, W-H-O-S. I don't know why I wrote that. You can scratch the W-H-O-S out there. I don't know what that means. Um, it's just there. It shouldn't be. Just go ahead and scratch that out. It is confusing. But uh, basically... Uh, this is Jesus being defined by what he does. He's the Savior. He came to save us from our sins. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And those who find themselves having a need for God, that's the ones God came to fill the need of. Those who will not acknowledge their need for him, God really can't do anything for them. But those who will come to God looking for him, God will answer their cry to him. And uh, will save them from their sins and... Uh, give them so many other blessings. Um, this is the... Uh, that's strange. Um, this concludes the uh, systematic theology, if you will, of the doctrine of Christ. We'll uh, switch gears now and move on to what is called the biblical theology. It's kind of the fancy word for it. And what that basically means is just the doctrine as it's unveiled through the Bible. Um, Bible doctrine is not something complicated necessarily, although people complicate it because it makes them sound smart if they complicate things. If something is complicated sounding, usually it means the person has not thought through it very clearly or is trying to blow a smoke screen at you. The uh, more simple something is, the more profound it can be, or either that means you're in chemistry or something, if something's overly complicated seeming. I loved chemistry. It was something I did well in but it was complicated. Math is not good. Um, 
but math is the language of chemistry, my mom would always say. That didn't seem true. Math is numbers, chemistry was written in letters, my chemistry book was written in letters, not numbers. Anyway, um, but um, Bible doctrine is simple and God wants us to understand it. It does take study, it does take effort, and um, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. As you study Bible doctrine, you shouldn't just grab one verse, one passage, take it out of nowhere and build your own doctrine around it, but allow the whole Bible to speak, and that's the importance of studying the Bible. It's a, uh, it's a process which takes time and which takes effort. Um, I guess a good comparison to this is the game of chess. Very simple game to learn, very hard game to master, I'm actually not that good at chess. My dad consistently beats me and without even trying, frankly. Um, and despite all my best efforts, I can never win in chess against him. Anyway, uh, but um, Bible doctrine is something which even a young child can understand. Um, little kids do learn. That's why we have children's church and Sunday school for the children, because children can learn about Jesus and learn the doctrines of the Bible. And uh, Jesus said, basically, if we come come to him, we have to come with the faith as of a little child, uh, just believing what he says and receiving it. And so um, anyone can understand Bible doctrine. It's not something you have to go and spend years of college studying to understand, although that can help if you go to a good one, but it, it's something God wants for you to understand. There is a doctrine in the Bible called the individual priesthood of the believer. What that means is that the moment you believe in Christ, you are a priest before God. You have full access to God. You can understand the Word of God. You are made to uh, have that whole access, if you will, that the priests in the, uh, in the uh, time under Moses had. So, with all that being said, uh, with what little time does remain, this is not on this set of notes. It'll be on the next set of notes to come out. We've got about five minutes left. And we will look at uh, just a few passages. In understanding the uh, prophecies about Jesus, there are several things for us to keep in mind. Peter, who uh, was one of Jesus' disciples, he followed him. He was a uh, Hebrew. He was brought up probably um, in the learning of the synagogue system, the um, if I recall correctly, around that time, a young Jewish man for his, uh, what we would usually go for elementary schooling, he would go and he would learn to read, he would learn to write, and he would learn the law for several years. And there was options going on the secondary education, the law, and these sort of things. But um, he was someone who had studied the, the Word of God. He, he'd studied these things already. And uh, this is what he says. And uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So all the prophets before Samuel and all the prophets after Samuel, so that's including Samuel too, the prophets spoke of these days. We do not have a record of everything every prophet of God said. In fact, I would say we have a very slim amount, it's only what God wanted us to have preserved for us. We have only a very small amount of what God had his prophets prophesy. We don't know most of what they prophesy. Um, we only have what God has for us and wants us to have and understand now. And uh, to this, to these prophecies, we will look, the very first prophecy, Genesis chapter three, very start of your Bible, Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says this, um, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between who? Between the serpent. The serpent appeared to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He tempted Eve to eat the fruit. Eve ate the fruit, gave it to Adam. Adam ate the fruit, and because Adam ate the fruit, sin entered into the world, and uh, death by sin, so that passed, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And... Um, Anyway, God appeared to them in the Garden of Eden. They hid from him. God found them anyway. God spoke to them. And here God, uh, God has a particular rebuke for the serpent. And he says this, I will put enmity 
between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I imagine when Eve received this prophecy, she probably or she probably long thought about it afterward. Um, there is a lot in this prophecy. <laughs> Who will be the seed of the woman? Um, technically, how is this even going to happen? Because it takes both a man and a woman. It's interesting. Technically, Jesus would be the son of Eve, not really the son of Adam, because he didn't have a human father. He had only a human mother. Um, he, uh, how would this happen? I'll bet Eve often wondered. How was this supposed to work? Um, why would there be enmity? And you think about that. That speaks about because of the sin. The serpent tempted them to sin. They chose the serpent's ways instead of God's ways. And uh, so that's the basis of the enmity. And uh, it bruising the serpent's head speaks of uh, basically sin being dealt with. That enmity, that sin, that would be forever dealt with. The ways of the serpent would be gone. But what about his heel being bruised? Why would his heel be bruised? I'll bet Eve often thought about that. What's going on? Why are these things? And uh, um, I would assume Eve had a whole lot of more questions than answers. Um, I don't know what else God revealed to them at this time, and I don't know what else God might have revealed to Adam and to the other prophets in that age at that time. Interestingly, if you read the book of Jude, the book of Jude quotes a prophecy from Enoch, who was... Uh, basically seven generations down from Adam. And in this prophecy, he talks about the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. He prophesied about Jesus returning. So I don't know what all the other prophecies they had and they understood, but uh, we do know this. This first prophecy was given, and it gave hope. Because one day, the sin and all the uh, results of sin, the, the death which passed upon all men, the earth being cursed because of Adam's sin, and uh, all Adam's seed receiving death, all these things would one day be dealt with through that seed of the woman. And uh, so anyway, um, we will look further at the prophecies about Jesus next week. And uh, there are a lot of prophecies. We will not look at every single one, but we will look at um, them in detail as best we can, and uh, we'll go ahead and pray and be dismissed. Dear God, thank you for your word, for your goodness to us. That you did send your son to die for our sins and pay our debt for us and uh, to make us that we could be reconciled to you, that we could become the friends of God, the children of God, and uh, join heirs with Christ. We could have all these good things. Help us to be grateful for them. You know, live in the fullness of the riches you provided us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.